Hello, welcome, Aaron Sanders, this Agile guy. And tonight I have with me, Lavanya. How are you tonight? I'm awesome. How are you, Aaron? Doing really well. Uh, morning stream, coffee. Evening stream, beer. So just one, maybe help the conversation a little, which is, what are we talking about? Help me out here, Lavanya. What should we do tonight? Uh, and today I wanted to, you know, kind of deep dive into how it, how, what's the life of a product owner who's in re-architecting a legacy system. So a lot of PMs today uh, who are not especially in the consumer product space or the enterprise software space find themselves in this specific um, space where or across all uh, products they have this problem where there's a legacy architecture that you inherit. There's a lot of new features that you'll have to build and produce for the business uh, while factoring in how you would carry this legacy through into the next uh, generation of your business needs. So that's what uh, uh, it, it kind of poses a very unique problem from a tech standpoint, as well as from a business stakeholder standpoint. And uh, it's pretty layered. And that's what I think we should talk about today. What do you think? I'm up for it. I'm wondering, what does legacy mean to you? I think I think that's the, that's foundationally where we need to start. Let's uh, if you, let's start. Um, I'm an engineer by trade, so I would even start with what I mean by legacy when I call a product legacy. So, um, you have high maintenance cost of maintaining maintaining that software stuck. There's a lot of data loss and data issues. There's uh, kind of limitations to the features that you can possibly produce. And there is this lower performance overall from uh, that product. That's the engineer in me talking. But now let me dumb it down to a greater extent and say, if, uh, say, less than 20% of your, of your company remembers launching this product, then you have a legacy system. Sure. <laughs> Means less than 20% of your company actually saw the birth of this product or saw the launch of this product, and you haven't made any successive or consequent updates to this product, you are operating a legacy system. Uh, it has an old technology at, at its core, and the workflows are quite um, old and you know dated to some extent. So that's Perfect. a simpler way of kind of understanding what a legacy system would be. Time might not be the might not be a correct indicator because if we wrote monolithic code today, it's still a legacy system. Correct. That's, yeah. Mary Poppendick so, says that. Put your unit tests in now or you're creating your legacy. That's, so, that's true. So that's what that's what it is. Like if you are asking for if you if you are a stakeholder, if you're a any business stakeholder, or even if you're a product owner or a scrum master, and you have to communicate that, hey, you asked me for this simple common sense feature, but I'm going to take like next three sprints, that's six months, uh, six weeks to produce this feature for you, mm -hmm. then you're working with the legacy system. That's how uh, it's a good indicator for you to understand, you know, that's what you're dealing with. So there's longer lead times for a legacy system. And I think we're contrasting this to a, an end of life product, right? These legacy systems have to be maintained, operated, and it sounds like sometimes updated. And I'm hearing you say as well, there's uh, longer, it takes longer and that's a good indicator. So how do you manage that and manage so, people um, probably wanting things sooner? Yeah. So uh, I would actually even start by talking about uh, where do you actually find this in the real world? Um, okay. All of you have uh, talked about, all of you know how our healthcare system works or any educational platform works as an, or facility management platform would work or a construction platform would work. Just to take an example of how would you, how much time does it take for you to get a plumber home? How much time does it take for you to study your course online? How much time does it take for you to get a doctor's appointment? So this, these are one set of business use cases that you have to have in your mind. Now contrast that with how much time does it take for you to order food? How much time does it take for you to get a cab? 
So you see the difference between the specific products that I'm calling out. Mm -hmm. um, well, to be honest, remember, I live in the middle of nowhere. So all of that takes <laughs> forever. But well, imagining living maybe where you are out in Chicago, right? Yeah, yeah I'm I, based I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. No, so where I was going with that is um, on a fundamental level, the first set of examples, such as uh, calling a plumber home, constructing your house, getting a course, all of that, the, the service is the product. Like that controls the PNL. The operations control the profit and loss statements. They bring in the revenue. And the digital product is just complementary to it. Uh, so you want to see a doctor, the doctor's appointment kind of controls how the system is supposed to kind of work. Or if you want to buy a new insurance online, if you want to do anything, it kind of has the PNL is in that person's hand and not the product's hand. But when you look at um, consumer space or consumer product or enterprise products, it's, it's a lot like uh, having a really, really sm smart predictive product directly ties to your um, PNL. So there's a lot of more investment in that space. And then yeah. there's so much. The legacy term doesn't stand for a longer time. It's always re-innovated. It's always rebuilt. And it's not even questioned why we need to do this investment in this platform. What's going to be the return? Can we not just brute force this? I see. Um, so, yeah. Well, I was thinking about that. Then these legacy systems, are they more in organizations that don't think they're really in IT, that they're not in software, they're in a different vertical? Yeah, I, th I okay. think I think you're getting, uh, I think you're getting where I'm going with this, absolutely, uh, where it's, where even till date, where it's viewed as product as a complementary to the business and not the core of the business is where you would still see a lot of this, uh, you know, legacy systems being uh, prevalent in a, larger scale so today if you see google would google's a product all of us use and they make like 500 updates to their platform annually uh, so by the end of the year you are to totally working with a different google than what you started that kind of iterative investment in uh, producing code is possible when technology is the core of the offering while in a in a in a facilities or any of our you know uh, legacy systems legacy businesses um, iterative investment in code building is not seen as the way to go. It's, hey, let's get a project. Let's do the project. Let's keep it aside while we use it to get its value. And if it breaks, we'll go work on it further and like just fix it up or bandage it up and start trying to run our operations around it, find workarounds around it. And then we just manage that course. So there's a project-based approach to a lot of these industries while there's a product-based approach to core tech products. You see the difference there? I do. And the, the lack of investment then, uh, I don't know, it means that uh, you're looking at only reducing the cost to keep any sort of margin over it. Uh, but aren't you hiding the cost somehow of this? Absolutely. I think, I think that's, that's, uh, that's something that slowly within a couple of years, you'll start to realize your indirect cost. That is the human brute force that you need to invest to cope with poor tools uh, goes up. And you, 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 would, you would think, hey, I invested in product. I have, I, I have a IT department of like 60 people. Like what, what's happening? You guys made me projects. I still have to hire people to do this. Uh, and you, you, you're just hiding that specific not investing in product cost will come back and bite you when you are having to hire extra personnel. Uh, so it's like, do you want to cut, chop down a tree? Do you want to do that with like an electric axe or a like a normal axe? If you want to do it with a normal axe, you need like probably three people going at it. Well, if you had the electric axe, it was like, take care of it in one go. Yeah, and it's also interesting when you talk about project versus product, right? In the shorter term, get this project finished, mm -hmm rather than the longer term, keep this product going because that's really where the value and the money is. Absolutely. So when you, uh, when, when we are transitioning into like data focused products, project mm -hmm. uh, mindset won't 
actually scale. Uh, you can't just write up uh, an application that kind of collects uh, data once and then mm -hmm. kind of has a ton of bugs. Uh, it's, it can't be like, you know, you use them through products. So uh, the, the idea of having to do a project versus a product clearly shows the quality of the software stack you receive uh, and you put out to your customers. Uh, and that's the, that's the thing, right? Like there's two people, like tech, technology folks, that's the core people who will be producing the product as well as the business operations or stakeholders who will be receiving that product to run their operations and business. That's how these legacy systems would work. Uh, if these, be, these business stakeholders became users, they'd be immediately able to see where it lacks. Why is the speed so low? So uh, as much as we talk within product that, hey, we need to eat our own dog food, it's so true about operations folks and business stakeholders as well, you know, going in and seeing exactly what they're delivering to their clients and understanding the importance of, you know, investing in tech. Absolutely. What I'm hearing too from you is that stakeholder, it you're defining more as that internal stakeholder that is the sponsor funding it and that maybe a pro tip in managing them is having them act as the external stakeholder as a user go through the experience and say what why why is this in production absolutely that's that's uh, that's absolutely true so uh if you if you if you look at this like if you take an example of okay now you are assume you're you are supposed to manage the construction of an highway around the Dallas Fort Worth airport. Mm -hmm. And you have some sort of a product like construction management software that's your back end. Uh, what you the way you're generally wired to is if if your production is going to be off budget or off time, what you think is, oh, should I be hiring or firing the existing foreman and getting a different guy? <laughs> and your first thought is not, hey is the optimization tool that these guys are using set right is it is it adjusted just right to the to the way i want to run my business so kind of switching to that and not assuming that you have an example of a product there and then investing in re-architecting that entire stack to actually see the value you want to deliver you want delivered is where i would i would suggest we need to go Okay, I think sometimes re-architecting these legacy systems is like changing the wings on an airplane in flight. And I would love to know, do you park the airplane? Do you get it out of the sky? How, how does this work, Lavanya? I so really am curious. This, this is why uh, I keep joking that working as a product owner in the space ages you. <laughs> so you work uh, two years or three years and you already feel like you're, 10 years worth of, you know, uh, hardship that you have seen, you are absolutely right in saying it's it's like operate, operating on a live uh, heart. It's like you're trying to clean up the engine while the car is still running. And, um, that's where the fun <laughs> comes. <laughs> so, yeah. Fun, um, yes. That's <laughs> what I was, that sounds like code. <laughs> uh, honestly, I, I'm a pro, but... Yeah, it's it, it's the thrill that you live for. That yeah. you know, you brought up a really cool question. That is, I, I agile is iterative learning by experimentation. That's in stark contrast with how this business needs to be handling these launches. So, so should we throw away agile and just do waterfall, or uh, can people do the, do people have the patience for waterfall? These are the questions that you know. Uh, keep me awake at night for the most part uh, to come back and say how you talk about this or how you do this. I would say double down on agile, uh, double down to a great extent where use to the core job to be done. Like this is where a pro good product owner, a good tech team needs to really uh, come together and invest the time in deep discovery. Okay. understand the job to be done and then the next step from there should be chalk out how it's getting done today include like it could be hey i click click these three things here and then i open up this excel i look at that here you know understand that entire humans work so i not 
okay so after you have documented that then you see okay now if i have to remove just this left ventricle out and then place a valve there right will the heart still keep running and then Did you, you have this <laughs> and then keep it on bypass while i'm changing this millisecond swap uh, and then you uh, test it out heavily on stage a stage mm-hmm. environment is the only place that will save you and you yes. you do that and then when you are pushing to live you better be very sure that you are not doing doing more ill than good so th- that's what i i keep telling my team it's like just don't make it worse <laughs> if, if you I just see. keep it exactly as as good as it is that's fine but just never make it worse than what it was um yes it is like you are absolutely right in saying it's it is like uh, operating uh, or changing the wheels out of the airplane <laughs> while it's flying it's flying along yeah so maybe some gates help a little bit of really banging on things and staging before putting in production however i'm also hearing the agile principle of maximize the work not done and the scrum value of focus and that's if if you can have a team focus on the few you stand a chance of maybe even i would think shrinking that the time it takes to get that into production okay question how do you help people focus on the re- really critical is that part of that discovery to see these into the inflows that's a really good question so first thing in that uh, first step in that life cycle is stakeholder buy in like your stakeholders have to identify that that is a pain point worth solving uh, and you immediately try to attach a dollar value to it from that standpoint you say okay if i clean this up uh, how much of the operations is it going to impact mm-hmm. is it is it going to be everything i do would have been uh, altered by 1% if that's the amount of impact this is going to have and you can if you can attempt to attaching a dollar value saying hey you optimize this specific document sending out workflow i send this document out 30000 times in a year and if you move it from 13 step process to two step process you would have saved four, four of my uh, compliance associates time eight hours of work across the entire if you can come down to that math and just put that value to that optimization you now know exactly what you're behind you you have baseline metrics on how much time does it take for them to do this as soon as you have this document it kind of kind of aligns everybody in the team behind it it kind of brings in that inter- intentionality that needs to come for them when they ask you something so it it, it kind of really helps them prioritize with money yes. uh, and then you start okay. and then you start negotiating okay uh you go you go back to your engineering team and say hey is this technically feasible can we do this and then if you get 100% then you go promise say hey i could probably do 60% of this and then you wait and then you see everything in stage and then you push it to life so just kind of immediately putting dollar value to it and and rationalizing exactly why this was the number one priority that we picked up and immediately showing impact as soon as launch is happened so you launched within next 3 days within next before the next sprint review a pm should know is that made money or not and she should immediately talk back to the development team and say say hey you did this and that saved us $60000 say keeping that kind of really keeps everybody going because it becomes a game at that point yeah uh, a game of streamlining reducing operation uh i'm sorry operating expense and uh ops tuning and really fine tuning that game and by itself i mean that's focus and wow courage i would think uh, yeah uh, it, it, it's super fun uh why i i keep calling this closer to a game of treasure hunt or like temple run or something something of that so i i actually yeah. have a, a visualization in which i would tell them hey this is our road map and i would actually lay it down like a temple run <laughs> thing nice. where you hit it and then you get some coins and then you get hit it and then you get another set of coins um, i i do that because it actually uh, communicates really well up and down uh, so you can talk about that value to stakeholders and say hey uh, your patience with this much patience if you waited for like 6 weeks 
Th this is what we can produce. And then I would go to my uh, team and say, hey, you get six weeks to earn this much money. <laughs> so so it's a, it's a two way, it's a two way thing. Uh, the, actually, uh, even from an engineering standpoint, even if it's possible, the hardest thing around this is initial investment and prioritization. So as a, as a business stakeholder, they want everything and they wanted everything yesterday. Of course. <laughs> so, it's not, so getting them to, okay, you want everything. You have, uh, so you have created this mess for 20 years. You should give us at least 20 days to fix it. But yeah. that's, that, that's the conversation that tends to happen around <laughs> this. Wow. So, so you try to show results three days, ask for three weeks and say, come on, you have 20 years. Yeah, so that, that's the kind of uh, timeline. So I, I, would, I would even say, uh, on a serious note, I would even say it's, it's, uh, it's about uh, change management. It's about mindset. You know, mm -hmm. it's about, okay, you, you want this. There's no doubt, but there's structured ways in which product can be produced. And then stakeholder education of how software code actually gets produced is very critical to this mission of, you know, incrementally delivering value. Uh, so every time you launch something, if you didn't manage expectations ahead of time, every launch is a failure. If you managed expectations ahead of time, every launch is a successful launch because everybody has that clear cl clarity on exactly what is the value that is going to be delivered. And why was it the top priority? And did we all agree on that was the first or the most important thing that we wanted to achieve? Um, so that's 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 the game. So change management and you know the mindset towards this and educating stakeholders around this is the first step towards you know trying to keep focus. Sure. Okay. So in the a little bit in that gaming theory, do you do you have some cheat codes here? So pro tips for that mindset and that change management? Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say pro tip, uh, a very candid honesty is where I would go. Uh, to a great extent, people are really, really uh, rational, understanding and want to collaborate no matter what. Like that's exactly how people operate in all spaces. Um, if they are, uh, probably escalated around something, then they are not specifically escalated at the product owner or the scrum master. They are escalated because of some other business pressure. So as a PO, it's incumbent upon you to kind of understand where their exact pain points coming from. Is the client pushing on them and that's why they're pushing, pushing you around. What, what is the core reason to have to an irrational, uh, stand from, uh, from any stakeholder, kind of understanding their empathizing with your stakeholder and then collaborating with them to handle that situation while they get something immediately and then we promise and buy patience from them and then go forward from there. So, Oh no. Listen, empathize and don't take it for we have a little jitter, I think. I, 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 was say, I was saying, uh, listen, empathize, and don't take it personally when somebody is uh, escalating. Listen, empathize, and don't take it personally. Just look Great. look at the solution. The empathy, that goes a long way. Yeah. And knowing everybody is trying their best. That's the only pro tip I have for this, Aaron. Be honest and humble. You had one and more. Uh, show results immediately. Yeah. And work together. That collaborate. Absolutely. And, yeah. The empathy, addressing something, working with the uh, stakeholders, not just keeping them apprised or advocating. Absolutely. That's what I, I always think about. Col collaboration really means working together. And I think that you're emphatically agreeing with me right now about that. And so that's really kind of jazzing me up. Absolutely. Um, one thing that's very unique to re-architecting a legacy system is skill set on the tech side uh, and mindset on the stakeholder side. <laughs> you know, you have to 
re reset up your skill set on the tech side to actually change from your legacy code to new code and then you have to sit down and change the mindset of your stakeholders to be ready for uh, okay you're going to start doing this product like the exact same product that you assume to have today like if you have a product and we are just going to re-architect this or refactor it to a greater extent with scalability with better performance in essence, they might wrongly uh, summarize it as it's the exact same product. It's absolutely not the exact same product. The, the possibilities opens up with such a product free architecture. You will have better performance. You'll have better scalability. You'll have no lesser tech limitations. Uh, and the, the possibilities are endless with this new product. So the mindset is needs to be changed for the stakeholders. How do you do that is you rebrand the legacy system you don't you don't associate it you don't say hey i am going to go change the way your construction uh, workers profiles look you you go and say hey i'm going to figure out how to get people to sign on onto this platform and as a background you change the you know profiles that are set up in the system you have to rebrand so that it kind of as a po you have to do that rebranding so that it's not spoken about as if in the same sentence as if it's the same thing. It's absolutely not the same thing. Two things come to mind when you say that in rebranding is the rebrand sounds like a focus on outcome. And uh, Dave Snowden talks about uh, if you want to change minds, change language, change behavior. So the rebrand by itself might start that mind shift. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on in the coffin with that. That's true. Get new vocabulary for your product. Change the way you talk about it. That forces your team to change the way they talk about it. That kind of kind of takes them out of that meta state of hey, this product is already exists. I'm just going to improve it. Right. From that, it changes that to I am going to do something from scratch that will sunset this product. Instead of thinking, okay, I'm going to envelop this into this uh, and then just put a neat cover on it with a bow and then present this as a new product. It's not the case. You build something from scratch that will remove this uh, incumbent product. Sometimes you have to envelop it in, but you still have to have that full new outer shell that independently works by itself while accommodating for an incumbent product to be, you know, synced up. In, in some way, that's that might be a tech requirement, but from a tech standpoint, you have to believe that you're starting from scratch. Absolutely. And sometimes you are because you taper down, right? The old as you bring up something new or different or refactored, it's usually not in the same like part of Universal. the code or file or something. You are creating new yeah, files, new libraries, everything for that. It's Absolutely true. It's not even in the same universe of uh, things. It's about like, it's like, I, I keep joking around this about uh, like saying, uh, think about it like a Batman movie. <laughs> okay. It's Batman movie, but Christopher Nolan Batman movie is a Batman movie. <laughs> it's not the same as the old. So you, you are creating the latest Christopher Nolan Batman movie. <laughs> While Batman right. might be always there, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a, business owner once say to me, this refactoring seems like taking a lot of time to do a bunch of stuff with the same result. And I thought a little bit, but it's more like, I don't know. I spent a long time before I got really wintry here cleaning my garage and I can find things easier. They're still all in the garage, but they're labeled and put away and it's neat and tidy and I can walk through it. That feels like more like refactoring, cleaning, optimizing. Yeah, that's Adding that, that, that's a really uh, good uh, uh, a real world comparison. Um, I would even say when you're having to re-architect, you might be coming out with a completely different garage altogether. You might change your garage into a kid's room. Oh, I only it. wish. <laughs> I, I'm, 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 good point though. Yeah, Software, so you, that's way easier to do. Yeah. You could turn the garage into a turkey dinner, whatever. Yeah. 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 And, and that's at some level, that's what you would be doing. So um, you might take up a, a system which you, an internal user only had control to, and then you 
take it and provide that controls to an external set of users and then you refactor the entire permission space, you refactor the entire user experience, uh, then it's a completely different product. I mean, mm. which does have some DNA of the original product, but it's not the same. It's a re-architected new product that encompasses and holds the DNA of the original product. So it's like changing your garage into like a castle. Like that's how <laughs> re-architecting re generally goes. Yeah. And it has this uh, evolutionary feel to it as well that you're talking about, that you're growing and adapting the product in a different direction rather than, I don't know, adding or deleting or like riveting something onto the side. It sounds way more organic what you're talking about. Absolutely. And that's that's the magic of software code too, right? Like it's not so physical in nature. We can we can actually do that. Um, bringing, bringing back that tech standpoint. So this is magical when we talk about it. It's the most painful thing when you want to do this. <laughs> so you sit down with your tech team. It's about uh, handling all the possible tech debt that they have mm -hmm. ever created, accumulated across the past 20 years. So you, it's all the all the trash that you have thrown in your garage and now you have to clean all of that up. Oh, There's going to be so start? much resistance. There's yeah. going to be so much resistance to True. doing that. And and the general mentality of why touch something that's not broken, like why why do you why do you want me to touch it? It's working. Again. If I go in there, I might find some rats. I don't know what I could find. Like why do you even want me to do this? <laughs> so that's that's kind of one of the hardest thing for for you to manage as a CEO with the engineering team who works with very closely with the engineering team to produce these products. To be like, okay, there is tech debt. Debt, it's not going to go away because we wish for it to go away. We have to pay this tech debt. Uh, how are you going to factor tech debt in while you want to immediately show value so we get funded some more? That's yeah. the balance these POs have to kind of face. Sure, and since it is an analog, right? Uh, my financial advisor always tells me, pay off your highest interest debt. And it sounds like part of what you're talking about, Lavanya, is you better have information and evidence at reach all the time to, to make this work. That's what uh, I'm really picking up. Absolutely. So now if you even, you, you're, you're right. Now if you think about it from the stakeholder standpoint, you're going to ask for some money. So any product team, let's say roughly is $1 million with uh, a PO, a good scrum master, uh, five backend developers, five front-end developers, one UX, all put together a grand total of $1 million for a year. I'm just yeah. absolutely guesstimating here. So you are going to ask Depends this. on market. I don't think you're way off. And we haven't so, even talked about like the hardware or if you're in an office, yeah. all that overhead. So yeah, yeah. I buy it. We, we are a good we are a good business. We optimized our overheads. We we are somewhere we have managed oh, okay. to keep it at one million. So that, that's the reality we are in. Say All right. say that's the reality we are in. That one million is not like a blank check. A stakeholder is going to write your way. You know, it's going to come in increments, and you have to continue to produce value to have received that one million by the end of the year, and it could stop at any point in time, <laughs> right? So for you to do that, you have to immediately be meaningful to the organization. The impact of the business, impact of the product to the business should be immediate and, and, and successive. Quick, impactful products is what keeps the money flowing towards product as well as money flowing in for the business. It's very mission critical for us to be agile about this while it's quite impossible for us to be agile about it. Yeah, sounds like quite the needle to thread. That's and... why I call it fun. I'm sorry? That's why I call it super fun because it's not a solved problem. Yes, big puzzle. A lot of achievements to unlock here. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, uh, I mentioned the quick successions of releasing the product. Um, mm -hmm. That's something, even if we rig it to a great extent, even if I'm the best engineering manager I have the best way. I am ready to uh, discover immediately. I'm ready to do two-week scrums of um, dual track scrum. I immediately discover. I immediately develop. I'm ready. I have tested it in stage. I've used the test. I'm ready to go. There's also a little bit of risk tolerance of the business. 
how quick right. can you go? How how much change can you introduce into your ecosystem? If there are internal users, how much are you ready to manage that kind of change? If there are external users, are there do they have a say in how many times you can change this? Or or if they don't have a say, are you ready to give them like uh, 300 updates a year? What is your business's risk tolerance? Uh, that's another thing that a PO might have to definitely think about. Okay, you want to do a track scrum. You want to discover and develop immediately. Is the business ready for this? That's another question we have to uh, deal with. And I would think too, is the tech environment ready? Do you have the CI CD pipeline? Because chances are with legacy code, maybe you don't. And then that's a conundrum to balance. I always that's like not- smaller, more frequent change sets, but maybe you're you're hampered by the deployment tools and everything else. You're absolutely right. Legacy systems are uh, an absolute thing to launch, deploy. And if you have a semi-hybrid model of some legacy, and then I had a Zen moment, and now I have a scalable <laughs> something. Yeah. That's, that's like in the middle Magic. of something. Now, now you have this hybrid that you have to deal with where some of the code is legacy, some of the code is new and brand new since you now have this new sense of realization but both of them need to work together for your business. You can't just say, hey, I'm in this free of a cleanse, so I will go change whatever part of the code. If something doesn't work, it's not my it's not I'll my get back to you in a quarter, right? Yeah. I mean, That's- you're, I'm sorry. I think we're both very excited by this, but I, calling back to immediate impact and always trying to figure out not just what the stakeholder is asking for, but what do they really need? And well, you're getting past that instead of really digging down in there of what they need with this focus on some things you know with the math and the evidence. You say, here's something, and they're like, oh, wow, we totally need that. And so it's that that proof that you're just constantly interacting with stakeholders and showing them that you're delivering against their needs, whether they know it or not. I mean, they probably do that when they see it. And they're like, oh, yeah, outcome, need that. I, I don't know. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, you're 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 uh, absolutely right on that, and I think this is where your changing the wings in the flying airplane kind of comes back. Uh, it's it's about uh, it, it's very similar to that. While you want to do this, there's the risk, or even if your stakeholders okay, they have understood this, they are risk ready. Um, you do this. <laughs> did mm-hmm. you deliver the best solution that you could have possibly delivered, or did you just deliver a solution. Uh, our stakeholders don't generally tend to know the difference between the best solution we can produce versus a solution. They see your solution and they are happy because they were in too much pain to begin with. It it falls on the PO to kind of chalk out to say, hey, I know we, ra- we want to rush this and having that patience at that critical point in time where you are actually rushed by everybody to launch, but you are ready to hold the ground and say, Give me another two sprints. I could come back to you with a better solution. And that's something, that's a trade-off you should be willing to do. So it's a funny thing as a PO. In the beginning of the project, or you should be always rushing everybody. And then just about when it's supposed to launch, you should be the complete hold the brakes person saying, okay, I'm so happy you guys produced all of this, but I'm going to have to take a hard look internally and figure out if we did the best thing for the business or we did a thing for the business. And I would say that takes a lot of, uh, you know, some sort of character and some sort of goodwill with your stakeholders to have that conversation with them. Say, hey, I know we have a solution. You have seen it in stage, but wait, give us that time and you will see a 10x product versus a four, five X or even six X product. Yeah, 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 half X product. But yeah. that, when you and that's very important for you to have the guts to have that conversation and also to deliver uh, the value and especially now that you're buying patients from your internal stakeholders, it has a ripple effect. They might have to manage expectations outside as well. So mm-hmm. when you're doing this, uh, you should definitely do this at all cost. But when you're doing this, be ready for that kind of pushback as well. Uh, I bet, but. You've been setting the stage all along, showing impact early and often, and they're seeing it growing. And 
it's at the deadline they're like oh my gosh this is so much better and you say yeah but if you just gave me an encore performance here we could crush it we could notch it up that much more give me one more sprint a couple of weeks something not a ludicrous amount of time either you're not asking for quarter half year right oh absolutely um one one thing that tech team tends to run into while while doing this re-architecting exercise is uh, uh legacy trap doors <laughs> they wouldn't okay. have no it's when, a trap. when you have yeah it's it's genuinely like that so um uh, i would say these are one of my biggest uh faux pas like i have failed in this so badly so many times um is scoping how much time it would take for us to uh re- redo some of it and honestly uh, i i i don't know most people would take a more conservative ro- route i tend to take a progressive route saying hey tell me uh, how fast can you do this and they would come back with some scope uh, i would scope of like some story point scope say one sprint 28 story points with some people and then i would negotiate it down to a greater extent to say did you understand the requirement are you sure this is exactly how you uh, how much effort this would uh, take and then we come down to something kind of time boxing it in a more constrained way to say okay this is how much time you have to figure this out in and most of the time i have learned that within that one sprint that i negotiated down to they would have realized the blockers that they have if i had given them two sprints at the end of two sprints also we would have just realized the blockers at the end of the, the two sprints just because of that negotiating exercise we know the blockers one sprint one sprint ahead of time so we are like that much closer to actually re- ready delivering a, something useful did, did you get that yeah i think a couple of things uh there's some narrowing of scope up front but there's this thing known as parkinson's law and it is essentially whatever time you give me i will take and so we're negotiating may- maybe narrowing on scope but saying no not not a month two weeks what 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 can we do in two weeks and maybe as much as you can do in four or because of maybe delay or whatever, you, you don't really discover the issues till later. So let's compress the time, but also let's narrow the scope and see if we can get something earlier. Is that- yeah, the, with, with this legacy code or re-architecture theme that we are talking about, this is more essential than ever because you wouldn't have thought that a boulder will fall on you while you're running. That, and that will definitely happen <laughs> because you don't account for boulders falling. you would just account for okay yeah, i see the requirement i know how much code I, new code i have to write i know how much new uh, data structures i have to produce i know how much algorithm i have to kind of learn to figure out how to do this in the future state like so i, I know how how much discovery and dev work i need to do but you don't actually know or nobody can guess what's going to go wrong like nobody thought covid have would happen <laughs> it's similar to that like nobody will know what part of your legacy system is going to uh, come in hit you in the face with this one I, I, as i told you in the beginning of the meeting you know if you have a legacy code when less than 20% of your staff knew the product launched yeah. uh, so you genuinely unless and until you have a god for documentation you will never know no. and the i mean software development is already so non predictive that when 80% of the talent that knew about it has left even predictable things so you have to step through and figure out and don't understand cause and effect and uh absolutely i think we I are think trying to go fast and all of these things slowing us down but you're really giving some great hints at what can help manage this and i'm wondering uh, a little bit more technical what do you find as like the right kind of information because again that just seems so important here what's the right level of information to track and how do you get that collected how do you convince others what to look at to or do you just collect it all and then do analysis later what does that look like so uh, i wish i i knew uh, i i wish i knew the exact approach when i don't know the exact approach i'm i'm all about do everything something will hit <laughs> uh, now let me let me actually say what actually gets done on the field 
Okay. Um, so experimentation is where I go with this. So do a trial. If it's failing this way, that teaches you something. If it's failing a different way, that teaches you something about your legacy code. Uh, the most of the time, one thing that really surprises me about legacy code is how does it still work? Like, how is it still standing? How is it still working? Like, figuring out how this thing is working uh, is the key. So I, I don't know. I probably this is a term most people know, but this was kind of a revelation for me. It's called trace routing. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you do is, if this happened, probably these are the things that would have happened for this to happen. And you sit down and do this exercise with your tech lead uh, and say, okay, now you don't know. I don't know, but we both are really high on common sense and we both are the smartest people in the room. Let's assume that. And we have all we've got. And we have this black box that we are going to change fully, but we really don't know how this black box is set up. So let's start trace routing to a great extent. So this is where the discovery tickets come back in. And those discovery tickets are not like, hey, go figure this code out. It should be clear experimentation written in those tickets to say, this is how you have to run this experiment. And if you got this output, I understood this. If you got a different output, I understood this. If the test failed, then I'm happy because I don't have any legacy code and I'm just, I get a blank slate and I get to start from there. Kind of writing a very clear discovery ticket around this with all your hy hypothesis and assumptions documented kind of gives you a baseline. Does that help? Yeah. It does. What if that trace route, you wind up in a unknown destination? Does no, that, that happen? And so what, how do you get out of that cul-de-sac or wherever you are? It happens more often than I like to admit. Uh, and then uh, uh, a lot of times a, a system looks rather simplistic. And so when you are a user, a system looks pretty straightforward. It's how much you understood of the product is the product for you. From a developer standpoint, it's just a crazy web that they don't know where, what connects to what. Uh, when such experimentation is done, uh, the, we'll get completely different results that none of us hypothesized. And then I tend to take that and go and try to use that product like that. Okay. And then if that Work. Recreate yeah. that result. Recreate or that result without looking at the code. Don't bother ah. looking at the code base. Ah, Sit down with your product as a user. And then actually after the fact, you go to your stakeholders and you talk to them about it. They have long forgotten about this feature. They would have swore to God that they asked for it, but nobody built it. Uh, and they, that's another evidence why product sucks. Uh, but, and, and then you show them this and they're like, I never knew this existed. And, and then uh, two things are learnings from that. One, um, product, ma product manager's job is as much of a marketer's job than anything else. Everything you make, make a big uh, shout about it. Like people should know if you made something, they should know it. Even if it was one of the things that you got done in one story point. You don't know the impact of that for the other user. Like, it right. didn't take you any time, but you still need to talk about it. Um, and second, second thing is when you find something that is completely forgotten, realize that it's not a priority. And if that's some code you can do away with, you can shade off with and tend to say, okay, now that I don't actually need it, if it's interfering with my re-architecture, delete it. Like have the guts to change core products like that without any, uh, have that authority around it, just because if they wanted it, we could always recreate it. We know how to do it, but it's not worth it to bother with refactoring it along with this because nobody cares. Got it. That back in the debt metaphor, default on some of it, you're paying off your uh, real high interest debt. Some of the low interest debt, maybe you just let people maintain the minimum payment on that. And some you're just like, you know what, we're not going to pay on this at all anymore. Just see what happens. That's, that's absolutely right. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll find a lot of obsolete uh, business workflows. Like when you're doing this trace routing, you'll find a lot of old uh, tech stack. So when, so one of the 
key things that you have to realize as a as a PO who's attempting to climb this mountain is have your uh, desired outcomes ahead of time. You you should you should straightforwardly say I want this in uh, Angular JS ahead of time. You don't need to worry if you are in HTML one. Like you don't actually need to worry about it because now you've taken a a policy decision or a strategy decision that I'm going to be in Angular 5 when I'm done with this product. That's a tech decision you take. And with your stakeholder, you have that conversation with them saying, I don't care what your business workflow has been in the past. I, I understand your workarounds that you have installed from this, but this is going to be your new business operating procedure. Start training your people because the product is going to do this and get buy-in ahead of time and show them the value. Do you really want to click 12 times to send this document out as opposed to three times? Is there value in having those 12 checkpoints? Can we just do this in three and then kind of sell it? Right. And after you sell it, deliver on it. Show it. <laughs> <laughs> Show it and then deliver on it. Like taking yeah. those, uh, my ideal state much ahead of you ever getting to that ideal state. So I think my dad mentions that a PM has to be a dreamer and a doer. Like you have to dream enough amount of times and then you have to do equal amount of times. You have to shift between dreams and deeds. So I would say dream ahead of time and then go do the deeds that will realize that and show your dream to everybody ahead of time uh, and get buy-in. And irrespective of, irrespective of what your legacy code is, irrespective of where you stand. Begin with the end in mind. The Absolutely. outcome. Yeah. And it sounds like to some degree, the technology that enables that outcome and then show early and often, just keep showing and delivering and, and dreaming and doing, and probably equal amounts, like 100% of both. Uh, absolutely. Uh, one of the things I actually want to highlight around this is it's not like nobody wants this change. It's a lot of people, even if I don't have to change manage in the depth of their heart, probably they know this is the way to go. The biggest actual hurdle or roadblock they tend to face is around a business model, like monetizing this type of architect, re-architecture. What, where do I find the money? It's not like I have like 1 million in cash in my, you know, so far, so far corners. It's not, that, where do I actually find the money? And that's where I would say like, um, in healthcare or education or construction or facilities management or uh, any of the things that you would classify as I need this, um, there needs to be business model uh, innovation. We need to find out how can we monetize these products. Today, I know how we can monetize. Any Everybody knows how we can monetize consumer products. It's yeah. uh, time you spend on the platform. Mm -hmm. But in this case, or in, in this type of legacy um, businesses, you don't get that type. Of, that's not how you operate. It's not like, like hold the user in your platform and make more money. That's That doesn't generally tend to work. Um, so clear innovation around that on how venture capitalists could invest in to see the money immediately is where it's lacking. It's that business model innovation is clearly lacking. And that's why the speed with which we can actually produce consumer products is not replicated in the speed with which we can produce education products. Like we have mm -hmm. Khan Academy, we have Coursera, we have Udemy, you name it. Oh. NX, but we have like 18 uh, Netflix, Hulu and you know? Yeah. Hello, yeah. are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah, so we have like a, N number of stre entertainment streaming, streaming platforms that can figure out how to monetize as opposed to education platforms that don't know how to monetize. Uh, so we really need core business model innovation in this space, in, in the space that product is complementary. So it's the exact same product. If you look at Netflix or anything, it's a streaming platform where a video is shown and you learn something or you receive the entertainment value out of it while you're trying to uh, sift through a lot of, you know, Coursera videos or edX or Khan Academy videos and how to keep it free for long. Right. You know? So think about think about that. That's where the actual real hurdle for this kind of business line comes in. There's not enough business model innovation. Re-architecture is expensive. Um, as much as 
if all of if good pos with really good marketing and tech skills convinced everybody we still all of us go stand at where's the money okay i understand why we need to do this where where do you find the money love and then you're like okay <laughs> that's when you you start thinking how do how do we monetize this that's i think that's where the industry should start investing in figuring out how to find the money for these business models maybe that's our next talk global <laughs> maybe in 2021 yeah. i would like to educate myself a lot more so that i could solve for it <laughs> yeah that's a big one i think the only thing we really talked about is reduce operating expense because in tuning legacy systems is really not an asset being created maybe a little bit but that monetization only comes in cost reduction i don't know but, you're uh, absolutely right I I really appreciate the time that you spent with me this evening. We the one thing we missed on, we got so engaged in the conversation, never looked in on live stream chat. Do you mind if I just check and see if there's anybody asking a question? Go Let me ahead. Just give a quick check. And get this over there. V is back refactoring how to explain tech debt for stakeholders uh how to gather data of work improvement and cleaning up code so that's a question do you want to try to take that on absolutely uh that's a really good question uh how to explain tech debt uh make them use the product make them okay. <laughs> make them use the product and, yeah like make your stakeholder use the product and then create a mock up in which in an ideal state create a prototype in which hey you click this and now switch on your timer it will take you 30 seconds for this to load now you see this mock up it will be seamless like that's you kind of con- compare and contrast this is what you have this is what you could get if you let me do this thing that you can't see makes sense that that. simulate the erasure of debt look at that big pile of debt no debt what do you yeah. think should we do that simulate it simulate it and visualize it like definitely visualize the ideal state where you want okay. to take them visualize the ideal state ahead of time give start the meeting with hey use this do this job with this and now do this job in my simulation which one do you want to go do you see the value in doing this um uh, and then you talk about okay this is what it's going to take to do tech tech and right. honestly don't feel scared to show a, an er diagram to a stakeholder i have shown tons of er diagrams to stakeholders to say hey you see this is where the data is getting stored i need to migrate all this data from here to here because it is here all this set of features will now become green because they are not making the 60 second call to the other database they are making the less than 2 microsecond call to this database you see and and feel free to show that and animate it as if you are explaining that to somebody much younger than you they will understand absolutely and if you could show it as well right that's one of the things we keep talking about uh, you could show the shave down of the transactions look we need to move all this data let me move a little bit and again like set your timer look how long that took or yeah. or whatever start to show it and then extrapolate it across uh so you do this action 30000 times a year okay mm-hmm. then that's eight uh, full time employees for a whole year i just saved you there by doing taking care of this one tech debt issue that i'm bringing to you yeah and i need the equivalent of maybe two full time people right i'll save you eight you give me two so that's six, six in your favor <laughs> Yes that that's literally how you how these conversations go and and more often than not just assuming that they'll understand and then talking to them as if they are your tech equals really helps and it actually helps you in the long run because next time when they are asking for features they'll be like how much tech debt does that create if i want it in two sprints versus six sprints and they tend to ask you that questions because they know because later is they that's rush that's the timeline we'll produce whatever we can and then later on come and show them the same video saying hey we produced this in 2 weeks uh, instead of the original 6 weeks we asked for now give me time to clean up tech debt they tend to ask this type of questions if you bother to educate them ahead of time and then it sounds like you get some room 
So with that impact of delivery and improving lives and all that, and you say, okay, now we just want some time to get way down under the hood, clean some things up. We'll talk to you in a couple of three sprints. Just see you later. But there's so much in this you're talking about of honesty and openness and transparency and courage and focus. And once again, this agile mindset and these these values and principles we talked about. Over and over. Absolutely. Uh, I'm a you're preaching to a convert like I I am I'm a absolute believer that uh, we can be very uh, dumb about this instead of being technical about this. How would a normal common Empathy. person who doesn't think about any of this do it? Just be yeah. that dumb person who's still very, very effective because you, you're a dumb person. You didn't assume they won't know things. You just went and spoke. And you're a dumb person. You didn't know things. You just went and asked. And that's about it. <laughs> you know, but that kind of being dumb, I mean, talk about courage to say, I don't know. I need to go figure something out or... Uh, to be able to explain it in a way that you can interact and get feedback and and not strut, you know, not show, look how much I know of this legacy system and all the ins and outs and code names and whatever else, just talking plainly and, and with empathy with that stakeholder. Absolutely. I don't think you sound cool when you... Uh say like when you talk with jargons you you are super cool if you could explain it to somebody who doesn't ex understand or, ha or has no background if you could explain that that's cool not your uh, and it takes time for you to kind of move away from your core skill set like if you are if you come from an engineering background which i did come from and and it's really hard for you because you you have this innate assumptions about things and you should just be like, okay, that's how it works. Why didn't you know it? And it's absolutely not the case for them because they are about, hey, let's pick up the phone call and handle it. If I, if the if the construction is not going per, per, per my time, then the foreman is bad. That's how they think. Sure. Um, so understanding that is uh, very, very fun. <laughs> I see where you're getting your fun now. It does seem entertaining. Fun, yeah, it, it is. <laughs> it is, and 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 being a PO is one of the most uh, most people tend to call it thankless. I, I would say it's the most uh, rewarding uh, <laughs> job because you you succeeded or failed at your own uh, capacity. Like if you could convince them, you succeeded. If you didn't convince them, you failed. Like it's very straightforward for you. It's not mm -hmm. so if you're an engineer. If it's not so. It's uh, in, in in any in any other place in this game. But if you're the PO you live and die with your decisions and that's that kind of control kind of comes with its own uh kick and and its own responsibilities i guess sure and and tangible results i mean so much so much of this is intangible you really have something to hold on to there uh for a second i know we're a little over time uh, that plain language is the heart of user stories being able to explain like you were telling a bedtime story right that that is really what it's about there and again with that empathy and collaboration and understanding somebody else and it's not the jira ticket you file for clean up that tech debt it's being able to talk with others so i really appreciate that too lavanya and again really appreciate your time tonight i do hope you would consider joining me again i found this fascinating and i'm sure others will too i hope you have a wonderful evening and a happy new year oh thank you so much for having me and i love uh, uh learning about product and i've learned a lot from you as well so i really like the content you produce and i'd love to come back anytime uh you i hope you have a fun uh christmas and new year's and hopefully a awesome 2021 i hope so and i'm ending the stream so we're on Zoom.